like many areas, climate change is controversial. So how do you actually get around that controversy? Which is, we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So this is mandated by the United Nations to look at climate change and to look at the science and to summarize the science. So it's a collection of scientists from all over the world, both developed and developing world. It's interesting, each chapter has to have an author from a developed country and a developing country, so it's not just the Western world trying to tell the rest of the world what's happening. And it reviews the science about every five years. The governments discuss it and publish it. Now, the most interesting thing is the executive summary, which is all free to download, is agreed word by word by 193 countries in the actual uh, United Nations. So countries that you would expect to try and actually uh, block it, etc., have actually agreed to it and gone through the science rigorously with their own scientists and agreed to their statements. So what does it actually say? So the first thing about science is it's about weight of evidence. What is the weight of evidence? So here I've plotted up eight different analysis of the global temperature over the last um, 150 years. If you see one curve, don't believe it, okay? Because again, science is about repetition, about testing, about checking people's results. And as you can see, we have uh, NOAA, we have GIS, we have um, the Met Office, and we have NASA, all of whom have done these uh, analysis completely separately. And you can see, which is really nice, there are variations between the data. And I've just put on the average in a bold line. As you can see, there is a strong warming trend through this curve of about one degree Celsius, and we have the warmest year on record was last year. But this comes to a really important point, which I cannot emphasize enough. And again, I I'm really quite mean to my students if they don't get this. So science is not a sweet shop. You can't step into science and go, today, I'm going to believe that antibiotics are going to save my children's life. I'm going to believe that metal tubes with sticky out bits can fly me across the Atlantic to come here to lovely Florida. However, today, I'm not going to believe that smoking causes cancer. Pfft, the medics made that up. I'm not going to believe that HIV causes AIDS. That's the medics again. And I'm certainly not going to believe the physicists that CO2 in the atmosphere actually warms the planet. The reason being is science is not a belief system. It is a rigorous system of checking, analysis, data, theorization, and then rechecking. The whole of our society is based on the scientific method. Everything from your safety of your car to your iPhone is based on those premises. So, if anybody says to you, I believe in climate change, don't believe them, because again, you should look at the evidence yourself and make your own decision. So these are the words of the United Nations. So these are the words agreed by 193 countries. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal. So this is the data of how much warming has occurred over the last 100 years. By the way, the white squares is where we still do not have enough data to tell you how much, time has uh, how much temperature has changed. But it's not just that. We also have lots of other observations. So on the top left is Northern Hemisphere, spring snow cover, which I find quite depressing because this is basically my ski season, which is slowly disappearing. And as you can see, since 1960, a big drop off of the amount of snow. B, down here, that's Arctic sea ice. Many of you know from TV, the reporters love it. They rush up to the Arctic and see all the Arctic sea ice smelting. However, that happens every summer. So it's not really a case of reporting it. But detailed measurements show that over the last 40 years, we're getting less and less. 
Top right is probably the one that I find most worrying. It is the heat content of the ocean. So the air temperature, as we've seen, it has cycles, can go up and down. But this is the oceans just continually water, uh, warming up. If you think about it, the oceans cover 70% of the Earth's uh, surface and are three and a half kilometers deep. And then the bottom one is the sea level change over the last 100 years, which is about 25 centimeters, which may not sound very large, but if you're doing coastal defenses, that extra bit does cause problems. So, now the really interesting thing about climate change is then the scientists are then mandated to go, right, okay, tell us the, f tell us the future. Go on, model the future. It's really interesting because, of course, you would never trust anybody to tell you what the big game, whether the football game next week, who's going to win, okay? Who's going to win the World Cup? However, in science, there's an expectation that we can provide some sort of models to predict the future. And of course, the models are only as good as the data you put in. For me, the actual science is really good. We understand fluid dynamics. We understand how heat moves around the planet. That bit is actually quite easy. It's just a bunch of equations. The difficult bit is, of course, yeah, you lot because we have no idea what society is going to do. Okay? Societies are not very predictable. Um, AKA, ask any economist, did any of them see the 2008 crash coming? Okay? So again, societies are difficult to predict. So I always put on a think tab. So in 1916, 100 years ago, about the same time we're trying to predict the future, what fossil fuel would we be thinking about? Of course, that was the time when the British Empire was still in control, and of course, our major fuel source was coal. And we were worried about maintaining our access to coal. Post-Second World War, it's become oil. But nobody would have predicted that in 1916. I have to say, in 1986, I have to say, I blame my parents for lots of things. I really wish that they suddenly, in 86, had gone, you know these funny airlines, you know these budget airlines, I'm going to put some money into those, because I think, you know, they're going to take off. Who would have predicted that round Europe, that you can fly to Paris for one pound plus taxes? Okay? Just wouldn't have occurred to us in the mid-80s that this sort of transport and cheapness of air transport would have occurred. So it's very difficult to predict the future, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later. So the models are basically nets that actually reproduce the world in a computer. And again, you can see on the right-hand side the different complexity of the models. So the first one on the top, this is from 1990. These are the first inter uh, intergovernmental panel of climate change report in 1990. And as you can see, yeah, Britain doesn't exist. It's actually physically attached to Europe, okay? As our computer power got uh, improved, the second one is in 1995. You can start to make out different islands. By uh, 2001, it's starting to look quite realistic. And by the last one, in 2007 and 2013, the resolution of these models is actually really quite good. What's interesting is that the results from these models, actually, even with high resolution, better understanding of the climate system, the actual results don't change. So, of course, how do we do it? What are the results? So, if we look, we can model the past, and that's 42 models. And then we have 39 models that model the future, both extreme and trying to actually keep the world to two degrees. So, limiting carbon emissions will require sustained and substantial effort. And the interesting thing here is look at the red one. The red one is business as usual. Okay? This is, we're going to continue burning fossil fuels at the same rate. And we get to a between four and perhaps six degrees warming by the end of the century. The one that has 32 by it, and that's 32 different models from around the world that have used to actually get to that result, is a political request. So the politicians said, OK, scientists, you're looking at the future, We've said to everybody, we're going to keep the world to two degrees. Okay? We've said that's the only thing we said at Copenhagen in 2009. 
can you tell us how to do it? So scientists went away and they built a model retrospectively that said, if we have to keep the temperature to this, what do we have to do? And this is where the big challenge comes in. So this is the amount of fo fossil fuel emissions in these different scenarios. So we tell stories about the future, about what society is going to do. And each one of those stories ends up with a different temperature. So the one that's called uh, RCP 8.5, that's the business as usual one, which leads to four to six degrees warming. And this one down here, the 2.6, is the one that saves us and keeps the world to below two degrees. Now, the Paris Agreement has reinforced this. Again, 193 countries of the UN have agreed to make substantial cuts in carbon emissions. The only caveat I would put is two things, just to give you the size of this challenge. The green triangle shows you that to do this, we have to start cutting global emissions by 2020 in four years' time, okay? start cutting it. We then have to reduce it every year by about 3%. So that's more than it's been increasing each year. So we have to stop the increase and then start the decrease. And even then, the only way scientists could keep us to two degrees is that by 2070, we have to have negative emissions. We have to start sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere to keep us within that safe zone. So that's the challenge that the politicians aren't actually telling you if we wish to actually keep the planet safe. 